everyone, and welcome back to the exhibit hall where we are live with one of my very good friends, Dr. Justin Kwan from Cooper Vision. Justin, it's great to see you today. Great to see you too, Steph. Thanks for the shout out and the opening remarks, and uh, I really look forward to our conversation today. I am too, and I'm really excited to hear more about what Cooper Vision's been up to. So why don't we just start with that? Yeah, it's been a busy year, or I guess three years since I joined the company, kind of leading myopia management with Dr. Felicia Timmerman. Uh, but just in the time that I've joined, you know, uh, we were able to acquire GP specialists, which makes IC ortho K lenses for myopia management, um, and, and as well as, uh, you know, uh, synergize this past November as well. Uh, but we've been really trying to uh, have a contact lens for every patient. And that's really so critical uh, to serving patients with all refractive errors, astigmatism, and spherical alike, uh, and including irregular cornea. So yeah, we've been busy uh, trying to build this portfolio that can help practitioners deliver the best care for their patients. That's amazing. I think I read somewhere that you're able to fit like 99% of all patients or something because you have GPs, you've got ortho K, you have sclerals, you have hybrid lenses, you've got my site. So I mean, absolutely phenomenal as far as this incorporation of all these specialty lenses. That's amazing. I think we worked hard for that claim to say 99.9%. .9%, so you're spot on. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. 99.9. .9, that's what I saw. And then I thought, who's the point one? And then exactly. somebody said, I don't think they have a custom soft lens. Maybe that's the only thing they're missing. <laughs> yeah. Maybe the patient's missing a cornea. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Who knows? <laughs> Well, I know that you are so passionate about myopia management, so I definitely want to focus our conversation on that. So let's dive into myopia management. And I know there's already been a lot of conversation from the clinical track. I was just listening to uh, Shalu Paul's yeah. course and, you know, with Dr. Harthen, you know, a second ago. But would you say that myopia management is the standard of care? Yeah, you know, personally, myself as a minus 10 <laughs> with an axial length of 28.6 millimeters, absolutely, for myself, for my kids, uh, probably future myopes. Um, but even Cooper Vision as a company believes that. That's why we kind of went to those strides and efforts to get my site FD approved. Um, many years of planning even before that approval, because we knew that it would become standard of care. And I was very pleased to see that in the survey, uh, in that report from Eyes on Eye Care and Eyes on Myopia, that I think over 90% of those surveyed believe that it is standard of care as well. Um, but I still encounter colleagues, uh, ODs and ophthalmologists alike that would say, maybe there's not quite enough science or the standard of care is coming, uh, but actually it's been established two years ago, uh, April of 2021 uh, by the World Council of Optometry. So the standard of care has been declared two years ago. So we just got to march forward and, and really kind of own up to that, if you will. Um, and that is really kind of good news for these uh, kiddos with myopia. Wow. I mean, I didn't know that. So that's great. That should be like blaring from the rooftops and <laughs> we should have like banners everywhere, educating everyone on that. That is, that's amazing. I, I thought you guys should be like promoting that like crazy. <laughs> We're doing our best, yeah. <laughs> oh, I guess you definitely are. And speaking of my site, can you tell us why is my site so special and kind of give us a little bit more on what makes it different than maybe some of the other soft lenses that are being yeah. used for myopia management? Yeah, I mean, the first thing that doctors like is that's the daily disposable. Um, but really what parents cling on to is that it's an FDA approved product backed by a seven-year study. Um, but my site, actually, I, I looked into this a, a short while ago. The patent was actually filed and accepted in 2005. That was when I was a first-year optometry student. And so my site, the technology has been around. And what's key is that it was designed for children. It wasn't like a presbyopic multifocal that was repurposed and used and studied in children, but it was designed for children from the get-go, um, designed for myopia control, and in the past, you know, control and management were used interchangeably, but the FDA has become very clear that you need that indication 
to slow myopia progression in order for your device to be called myopia control. And to this day, my site still remains the only myopia control device out there on the market in the US. Um, and so that's what kind of makes it special is that the safety is there, the efficacy is strong. We can see that my site kind of slows that accelerated myopic growth back to emetropic growth. And that's kind of the benchmark of success that we see. Um, in that seven year study, there's just infinite learnings that we still kind of unpack and uncover. So um, we're really excited to share that as time goes by. Wow. I didn't know that, you know, 2005, that's, that's, that is a long time ago, as far as for sure. we're, we've kind of been growing and, and evolving and where it's become now, you know, from three year to five year to seven year data. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is absolutely outstanding. Yeah, it's the longest running uh, contact lens trial in children that we're aware of. Yeah. <laughs> well, you should be very proud of that. And I did have a question on when you're talking about FDA approval with parents, is that something that you have found, you know, practicing and hearing from other doctors that FDA approval is really important? Yeah, majority of our doctors bring that up as one of the first things they talk to parents about. Um, but even parents, we've uh, talked to them in private focus groups. We've surveyed thousands of parents along this journey of the last few years. And time and time again, they're like, I really value that FDA approval. It's something that I'm having my child be treated with. Um, I need to know that it is safe and it works. <laughs> and that kind of stamp of approval has been instrumental uh, to get kids in the right treatment. Yeah, and I guess that goes, that holds true probably with other patients. You know, if you're prescribing a medicine or something, yeah. something that's FDA approved, mm -hmm. I think a lot of patients feel more comfortable using that type of medicine if they know that there is that stamp of approval. So yeah, it makes Absolutely. sense that parents would also, and that would make them more confident and, and really develop a bit more loyalty and trust. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Can you explain how many kids have myopia and how many there are for each eye care mm -hmm. provider? I'd love to. It's a kind of a passion, uh, you know, nerdy part of what I do. Um, but, you know, I think a lot of our partners in optometric industry would say 15 million kids with myopia in the United States. Um, I actually put together an Arvo poster with an ophthalmology uh, resident last year. It's Arvo 2022. We used the census from 2020, um, and we kind of accounted for rural and urban rates of myopia, uh, rural, of course, being 2.6 times less myopia prevalence, because uh, a lot of people that move into the cities, pursue higher education, all that indoor time, um, there's going to be higher rates of myopia. But bottom line is that uh, we estimated about 19 and a half million kids with myopia, not just 15 million. And so when you consider perhaps, you know, 65,000 eye care providers, meaning 45,000 ODs, give or take 20,000 ophthalmologists. Um, it's going to be about 300 kids for every single eye care provider. Now, we know that very few of those uh, ophthalmologists, because they're doing glaucoma, retinal surgery, and all that, they're not going to be doing myopia management. But just hypothetically, uh, there's 300 for each eye care provider. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it just, it, that's a outstanding stat. And thanks yeah. for doing the numbers on that. This is, this was an exciting question that, that we had come up with. And I think it pairs beautifully with our internal symposium that we did for the newly eyed game show, because mm -hmm. we really did want to know, you know, <laughs> where do we think this is headed, you know, as far as how many kids are going to be in some sort of myopia management treatment protocol. But then I thought to myself, gee, I don't even know how many there are currently. <laughs> yeah. And I think like most estimates would say about like today, two to 3% of kids are in a myopia management protocol. Um, but I think it's growing uh, just from you know what we see and what um, all these companies are doing and, and all the awareness building that's happening. Uh, that number is going up, uh, but it's still far short of uh, the, the number of parents that believe eye health is important. Uh, so 95% of parents actually believe eye health is important. So even using that phrase eye health uh, can be something that helps a parent, uh, you know, move towards treatment because they definitely have their own biases uh, when nearsightedness or myopia comes up, right? Well, speaking of effective communication with parents, can you give us some tips, some strategies that maybe we could use? 
Yeah, uh, I have to really credit Steve Vargo with uh, kind of teaching me a lot in this uh, realm. Um, there's this book called The Three Minute Rule. It's about a sales pitch for TV shows, but the, a lot of applications to how doctors communicate effectively to parents and patients alike. Uh, I think there's a stat that says uh, the optic nerve conducts 25 times faster than the auditory nerve. Uh, so meaning uh, a lot of us are visual learners. So showing a picture like a longer eye from a shorter eye sometimes is mostly all that it takes and making sure that you don't talk to the parents too long because you might get diminishing returns. It starts to sound like white noise, um, mm -hmm. but to really make an emotional connection with parents and really ask them questions. And don't forget about the child, uh, bringing them in and asking the child a question as kind of maybe nerdy as it sounds, maybe asking the child, did you know some eyes are longer than other eyes? Uh, and your eye is growing a little faster than it should, right? Growing longer than it should. Um, and really kind of bringing the parents, getting them off their phone and participating in this conversation by asking questions. You make them active listeners rather than, oh my gosh, my site's going to slow your myopia progression by 59%. Like all this data is going to be forgotten within three days. <laughs> so you're better at uh, spending your time making that emotional connection and what that would mean for their child uh, during recess, uh, playing sports or ballet and all those kind of things, uh, as well as the long-term eye health implications. So it's all about making the emotional connection. Yeah. And I like how you said, you know, maybe just, well, there's two things that I really love that you said. One is that the eye process is faster than the auditory or yeah, something yeah. to uh -huh. that effect. Yeah. And I will say that in my new clinic, instead of me just talking to the parents and just verbally telling them what's going on with their child, mm -hmm. I have noticed a huge difference. If I show them one photo, like yes. you said, either yeah. <laughs> an eyeball and like one that's normal and one that's like really long and then yeah. kind of having a conversation on that. Um, you know, just having like a small visual or even the, you know, myopia uh, prediction uh, mm -hmm. calculator from Brian Holden Vision Institute, you know, even just something like that mm -hmm. can be so powerful. And it's just one little piece of information that yeah. um, that parents can really appreciate. And, I, and, and a lot of our colleagues yeah. today have um, the OptoMap, right? And uh, there's a 3D fly-in with kind of a toolbar on the right-hand side. There's actually a slider. If you drag it towards the minus 10 direction, it'll actually stretch the eye, the axial length longer. And that becomes a very dynamic visual, not just a static uh, image for the parents to comprehend. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay, <laughs> that's, ex that's, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> Even more ways for us to educate. Parents. Yes, <laughs> okay, here's another question that comes through a lot. How long do kids need to be treated and when do we stop? Yeah, so when do we start? When do we stop? And I, I love the Neely Odd game show, like, because we <laughs> definitely need to start as early as possible. And, you know, a lot of us uh, in this space kind of try to lead by example, like Dr. Harthin, right? So uh, I'm treating my son, Jake, <laughs> every other night with uh, O2 5% atropine. He's plus 0.5, which means he has premyopia. So trying to delay that onset as much as possible. Um, but yeah, start early. Don't wait to see progression. We know that 96% of kids get worse. So you don't have to prove it to yourself or to the parents that the myopia will get worse right? Because the child is growing taller out of their, you know, small to medium, you know, sized clothing and their shoe size and all that. And so that's very relatable when you say to parents that kids grow fast. Uh, but yes, doctors are always wondering and parents too, when do we stop? And it's going to be case by case, which is not what people want to hear. Um, the <laughs> easiest way I can describe this, uh, thinking of Mark Bullimore lecturing later when every day after matters, is that the target that we set uh, should be trying to get kids through high school no worse than minus three, right? So if you have a minus two senior going off the senior ball, you know, you don't have to treat that minus two very long. Uh, but if you have a minus four who's in sixth grade, you're gonna have to treat that child a heck of a lot longer because they have already surpassed minus three. They're nowhere near being done with high school as a sixth grader and a lot of growing years ahead of them. And so you never want to scare the parents, really tell them, as Dr. Rue has taught me, let's take this one year at a time, 
Um, mm -hmm. And kids, they grow at different rates. That's just a reality. So whatever it takes to get them through high school, no worse than minus three. I like that because I think that as doctors, we like want that magic number. And like you said, it's never always going to be that way. But at least if we have some sort of a game plan of like what we're trying to get them to or prevent them from getting worse than that, just yeah. as far as just a number to kind of relate to, I think yeah. that that gives doctors a little bit more confidence of what the goal is. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, totally. <laughs> And last question for you. Tell me about Cooper Vision's new campaign that just launched during Vision Expo East. Yeah, so this kind of ties back to uh, my point about how Cooper Vision has talked to a thousand parents, not once, but twice now. Uh, so back in 2019, we enlisted the Harris Bowl to talk to a thousand parents. And about 37% of them said they were either worried or extremely worried about myopia. Now they had kids in the eight, age eight to 15 uh, sort of range there. Um, so fast forward uh, three, three years later and uh, this past spring uh, and winter, we talked to another, a brand new set of a thousand parents. And this will be really encouraging for ODs and, and ophthalmologists alike is that after getting a diagnosis of myopia, 72% of parents would look online to learn more information. And that's where Cooper Vision is really showing up strong, um, is that we built kind of this digital ecosystem between YouTube, our website, things you can find at our booth uh, later today as you browse around, as well as our Instagram and Facebook to kind of meet parents where they spend time and provide bits of education one minute videos, you know, really short clips, uh, really heartwarming patient stories. Uh, so our campaign is called Make Children Cite Your Fight, uh, because I'll kind of adapt a little more here. Well, we need to fight for every diopter. It shouldn't be something that we passively do, or as like Mila said, kind of dabble in. It, we're going to hit this head on um, and really fight for every diopter when every diopter matters. So it's kind of this rallying cry, if you will, knowing that parents, 80% uh, of them will actually um, look to learn more about my site as well, uh, because they know that it's critical uh, and it works well. It's FDA approved, again, backed by the seven-year study. Um, so this is really high numbers when you think about parent interest. Uh, but starting at the office, at the exam room, you know, and with your staff, we've invested a lot of time uh, bringing staff up to speed so that they can be uh, kind of that critical part of the team to further educate. Because we all know that uh, parents will ask the staff different sets of questions than they might ask the doctor. And they really need to have that cohesive teamwork to accomplish what's best for that child. So, yeah, we're up to this new campaign. Just got started, uh, but you'll see more doctor-facing education and parent-facing education as the months go by here in 2023. Well, that's really smart because like we all do, as soon as we get some sort of diagnosis of anything, we are all online looking yeah. it up. So <laughs> yep, that yep. <laughs> is awesome that you've built this kind of network of like things that feed into all the different um, information and different channels and all of that. So congrats yeah. on doing that. That's really forward thinking. Thanks. It was a big effort. It took uh, many months to plan, but uh, yeah, there's a lot of great taglines. I think at the end of the day, we may sometimes forget what parents will do for their children, but we have to kind of position it and describe it, uh, like I said, as an eye health condition. But it really is the sooner we start uh, treating, the sooner we can finish. And that really is the reality. Um, the waiting is, is, the, is the worst part because myopia progression and where the kids end up, that's irreversible. Um, so that, mm -hmm. that again speaks to the importance of early treatment. Absolutely. Well, that was wonderful. Justin, it was so great chatting with you today. Thank you so much for joining us. And thanks so much for sponsoring Eyes on Myopia. It was great hanging out with you, Stephanie, and uh, look forward to the rest of the meeting. Bye. <laughs>